Dirichlet's divisor problem is similar to Gauss's circle problem in that we're trying to determine the average of a function using geometry. In this case, the problem is finding the average number of divisors. There are two functions that we will need to introduce. The first is known as the floor function, or the greatest integer function. Definition: The floor of x is defined to be the largest integer that does not exceed x. This function basically rounds a number down to the next integer. For example, the floor of 1.9 is equal to 1, and the floor of 4 is equal to 4. There is sometimes some confusion when computing the floor of negative numbers, but that won't be relevant for our calculations. As a side note, the book uses full square brackets, but the modern notation is to just use the lower bracket. The second function is the fractional part of x, which gives us the leftover after pulling out the integer part. Definition: The fractional part of x is defined as x minus the floor of x. We can equivalent define this as the floor of x is equal to x minus the fractional part of x. Notice that the fractional part is always a positive value. We will now look into the divisor problem. Theorem. There exists a constant c such that the sum of d of n is equal to n times ln of n plus c times n plus o of the square root of n. If we divide through by n, this says that the average number of divisors is approximately ln of n plus a constant. This situation is similar to the one in the previous section in that we're just looking at lattice points inside specific regions. In this case, we're going to restrict our attention to the first quadrant since the divisors are always positive, and we'll be working with hyperbolas instead of circles. Notice that d of n counts the number of lattice points in the first quadrant lying on the hyperbola x times y is equal to n. This means that the sum of d of n is the number of lattice points in the first quadrant on or below the hyperbola x times y is equal to capital N. We can break that region into three parts. The first part is the square of side length square root of n, whose corners touch the origin and the point root n root n. This is the part that's shaded darker in this diagram. The other two connected regions are the other two parts. Notice that the symmetry of the equation implies that these lighter regions have the same number of lattice points. The lattice points in the square are easy to count. There are the floor of square root of n squared of them. To count the lattice points in the upper region, we will count the lattice points along the vertical line x equal n that are above the square. We know that the line touches the hyperbola at the height of capital N over little n, so that there are the floor of capital N over little n lattice points below the hyperbola on the line. But the ones that are below root capital N are in the square and have already been counted, so we need to subtract these off. This means that each vertical line contains the floor of capital N over little n minus the floor of the square root of capital N points in the region. The sum of d of n from 1 to capital N is the number of lattice points below the curve x times y is equal to capital N. And based on the counting scheme above, we have a formula to compute that quantity. We can simplify this a bit by separating the sum. And we can now rewrite the greatest integer parts in terms of the fractional part. From here, we can start picking off the error terms. The second term is a sum of no more than root n terms that are no greater than 1, so this is O of root n. The fourth term is root n multiplied by a constant that's less than 1, so this is also O of root n. The last term is always less than 1, so this can be absorbed into the O of root n error. In order to estimate the sum, we will use a result from calculus. The book proves this in the appendix if you want to go through the details. For our application, we will first rearrange the equation and then use f of t equals 1 over t and capital M equals square root of n. We can now substitute this into our previous equation and simplify to get the result. This proof demonstrates a few of the techniques that are common in these types of proofs. For example, the big O analysis part where we combine multiple big O terms together is something that you would get used to if you were to continue in number theory. Using the integral test to help you evaluate the sum is also common. However, we do not have time in this class to delve further into this. Thank you for watching this video. I'm currently dabbling with the idea of creating more videos like these for my classes, and I welcome constructive comments that might help me make better videos in the future.